and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. In the modern era, we live in an age of nation-states. If you go back to what we learned in Political Science 101 uh, when I was a student, a state is an entity that maintains a monopoly on the legitimate use of force in a given territory. That is the formal dictionary definition, right? And a nation-state is a state that's organized loosely around nationality. For example, the French state more or less encompasses French people, except for a few very small numbers of local separatists. Most French people speak French as their first language, grew up in French culture, and if you asked them, they would self-identify as French. But the idea of the nation-state is a relatively modern one. As we'll see in a few episodes, it's an Enlightenment-era idea based on Enlightenment principles. But before the nation-state, there were other types of states, other types of organizations with a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. Some of these we can still see examples of today, even. Not all of them are pleasant, either. For instance, you have ethnostates, like the Third Reich, or like what Slobodan Milosevic envisioned for Yugoslavia. These obtain legitimacy in the eyes of their people by advocating supremacy for the majority ethnic group. You have religious states, like the old papal state or the Islamic caliphates. These obtain legitimacy by claiming to have received it from God. Through much of history in much of the world, states have taken the form of empires. Collections of various people held together by force or trade or other influence. Right. Imperial legitimacy can be more pleasant or less pleasant. People can submit voluntarily to an empire because it's good for trade or because they need protection. Or the empire could simply subdue them. Right. Resist the will of Rome and you may pay the ultimate price. But knowing that your imperial masters will do very bad things to you if you try to leave is a type of legitimacy. And legitimacy is really the bottom line here. If I threaten to lock you in my basement unless you give me money, that's a felony. If the government threatens to throw you in jail unless you pay taxes, that's the ordinary course of affairs. If I decide that you're a bad person and shoot you, that's murder and I am a murderer. If the government decides you're a bad person and cuts your head off, it's an execution. Right? Most people recognize the distinction between legitimate and illegitimate acts, even if they may not necessarily agree with them. And legitimacy is important for any form of government because in order to have a functioning society, the state needs the vast majority of people to comply with its laws voluntarily. You can only really deal with a small number of people who completely disregard the state. And if you have legitimacy, well, then most people will voluntarily go along. And in the Middle Ages and early Renaissance, at least in Europe, most states got their legitimacy in the form of rulers who, in one sense or another, owned the land. Yes, there were some exceptions, like the Venetian and Genoan republics, but even most republics of the era were merchant republics. The only people who got a say in matters were wealthy landowners and business owners. And even in other types of states, ownership of land usually wasn't direct. The king of France, for example, 
did not necessarily rule all of France. He ruled some of it directly, some through loyal vassals, some through disloyal vassals, and some of it not at all. The exact breakdown of that depends on what part of history you are in in the Middle Ages. Uh, At this time, a king or queen could rule multiple kingdoms even by virtue of inheritance. Or they could lose part of their kingdom by trading it away. The land literally belonged to the nobility, and kings and queens were the most successful nobles. And as a result, Europe would be ruled by an ever-shrinking cadre of the most successful families who would slowly consolidate their kingdoms into larger and larger realms. It's useful to think of these European kingdoms as businesses, with the families running them almost like modern organized crime families. That's a pretty good picture of what modern people call dynastic politics. And in dynastic politics, love as well as war could be used for conquest. For example, at its height, the Habsburg dynasty would rule most of Western Europe, and they would achieve almost all of this through intermarriage. Perhaps the best and clearest example of dynastic politics is the creation of modern-day Spain. Modern-day Spain is the child of Habsburg Spain. And Habsburg Spain, in turn, is the child of a union between a couple of older, smaller kingdoms. See, while people have talked about Spain as if it were a single country since the 1400s, it wasn't actually until the year 1716 that Spain itself existed as a single legal entity. Before that time, it was, at least officially, a union of the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon. The unification of Spain is a powerful demonstration of the transition from old-school dynastic politics to modern-day nation-states. But before we go any further into the story of Spain... A little housekeeping. As of today, uh, we're going back to the old schedule of episodes every two weeks. Uh, There are a couple of reasons for this. Uh, One primarily is uh, mental health-wise for me. I do have a day job, and putting out an episode every single week, in addition to two Patreon specials, basically has meant I have had no social life for the past uh, several months. And not only that, but my day job is writing, and it's a solitary job, as is podcasting. And with that and not getting out, I actually started to go a little bit crazy. And this has led to other issues, and it just is not healthy to be working 90-plus uh, hour weeks on a consistent basis. Uh, the other reason for this is, frankly, I think the episodes were better when they were a little longer and a little more freewheeling, and I would like to get back to that, and going back to bi-weekly episodes is a good way to do that. So, what does this mean? For regular listeners, it really shouldn't mean much of a change, at least in terms of the amount of content. Uh, If you have been around for a little while and remember the old episodes, uh, those episodes were a little less frequent, but they were longer. So in terms of the amount of content, it should be about the same. It's just simpler as a creator to make fewer, longer episodes than to cut that content up into a bunch of smaller chunks. And For Patreon subscribers, I will still be doing the monthly video, so nothing has changed there for you guys. Uh, What has changed, the only real major change, other than the timing of the episodes, is that I am suspending my partnership with the Salad Tossers. So 
Uh, the only people that would affect is if you are a member of their channel, if you have intentionally clicked on their Patreon link and gone there and subscribed. Uh, if you were one of those people, then the last episode of Irrelevant History will be uh, in September, uh, this month's episode. And if you haven't gone there and signed up specifically for that other channel, then you won't be missing a thing. As a matter of fact, for my Patreon subscribers, once September is over and my period of exclusivity on those irrelevant history episodes ends, well, we'll be putting those on the Patreon as a little bonus for you guys. Yay! Now that they housekeeping is out of the way, let's get back to our regularly scheduled program. Let's talk about how much of the Iberian Peninsula came to be called this country known as Spain. Spain gets its name from the Roman province Hispania, which occupied not just modern-day Spain, but Portugal as well. It basically meant the whole Iberian Peninsula. This area was a rich source of silver for the empire in its earlier years, and throughout the entire period, it was a major source of grain and soldiers. And then, like the rest of the Roman Empire, it fell into barbarian hands. We talked about some of this in some of the very early episodes on the collapse of the Roman system. These barbarians were first the Vandals and then uh, the Visigoths, who were a Scandinavian people who arrived in the 4th century. And as many of the barbarian invaders did, they would adopt most of the practices of the people they conquered. I feel like when a lot of folks picture the fall of Rome... They picture some apocalyptic event, and for the people living through it at the time, it would have been a much more gradual change. These Visigoths were just another ruler, and their kingdom would last until the 700s, when Muslim forces of the Umayyad Caliphate would cross the Straits of Gibraltar from Morocco and very quickly take over most of what we now call Spain. This would happen between the years 711 and 732. And the Umayyads would conquer almost all of Spain, and they would even cross into France before being stopped by a certain French national hero named Charles Martel at the Battle of Tours. And... At that point, at least in uh, far Western Europe, the dividing line between the Christian and Muslim kingdoms was more or less set at the Pyrenees Mountains, right? the mountain range that divides uh, the Iberian Peninsula from the rest of Europe on, on, the, on the border between modern-day Spain and France. The exception to this the only part of Spain not in the hands of the Umayyads uh, was the area of Asturias in the far northwest. Right, this was a relatively small area, certainly no match for the might of the Umayyad Caliphate, but the Muslim lands were not unified. Right, this was a religious war, this Umayyad invasion, much like the Crusades would be in later centuries. And much like the Crusaders, the Islamic invaders were multi-ethnic. Right? Some were Arabs, some were North African Berbers, some were Egyptians, right? some were from the Levant, right? They were Syrians. These are different groups of people. And after the conquest was done, well, they would go back to living in their own different areas. They would not unify all of Spain. Instead, they would go around and set up their own uh, districts, so to speak. So, uh, 
by and large, the Arabs settled in the east to work the fertile farmland there. Uh, the south became mostly settled by Syrians who were able to build ports and take advantage of trade on the Mediterranean. And North African Berbers would settle in the central hill country where they could graze their flocks, as is their tradition. And these new peoples form what is now called the Emirate of Cordoba, also known as Andalusia or Al-Andalus, a Muslim kingdom in Europe, in Iberia, although, as in many of these areas of early Muslim conquest, most of the local people have not changed their religion. Most of the people in Al-Andalus are, in fact, uh, Christians, and there is also a fairly substantial Jewish population. Now, things would not remain static uh, for the next several hundred years. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there would be constant uh, friction on the border. Probably the most notable incident was uh, in the 800s. Charlemagne would launch a brief invasion of the Emirate of Cordoba and seize a strip of land along the Pyrenees in the northwest. This land, known as Barcelona County, would begin as a Carolingian vassal. Right, Charlemagne was basically creating a little buffer state between himself and this Islamic emirate. But soon, Barcelona County would become independent and begin pursuing its own policies. And around this same time, additional local Christian nobles launched local rebellions in the northwest, in that area up around Asturias. And they would conquer a little bit more land away from the Emirate of Cordoba, and they would divide into three small kingdoms, uh, Leon, Castile, and a Pamplona. And all of these were very small and very poor and uh, very heavy on the military in their societies, shall we say. And what happens over the next several hundred years from the 800s through the 1400s is a long story. Right, this is an event called the Reconquista, right, the Reconquest. And it refers to the reconquest of Spain by Christian powers. Right, there are entire multi-episode podcasts which discuss the Reconquista in minute detail. Right, we are not going to do it justice in one episode here, and this episode isn't even about the Reconquista. It's about what happens afterwards. Uh, suffice it to say that this is a time of a lot of conflict, and it is a time where many national heroes are born. For instance, El Cid and Alfonso VIII of Castile both lived during this time period. So how do these small Christian states slowly reconquer this relatively large area of the Emirate of Cordoba, which is, you know, again, most of Iberia? And there are many answers to that. Uh, one would be, as I said, the relative division of the Muslim peoples into various areas, not all of which got along. Later on, the emirate would break up into different kingdoms, which all would allow the Christian powers to pursue a divide-and-conquer uh, approach towards them. But another factor is a sociological phenomenon. There is a saying that hard times create strong men, and strong men create good times, and then good times create weak men, and then weak men create hard times. And 
personally, I find that to be true. And this is a good example of it. See, the Islamic Emirate is wealthy and relatively well-to-do, and they are more interested, by and large, in art and science than in fighting, whereas, again, these Christian powers were very poor, at least initially, and attracted a lot of warriors. Right, The only people who want to move there are knights who you know, have no land or what have you and want to seek their glory fighting against some infidels. And later on, the Christian powers are actually bolstered by the Crusades. This idea of Christian religious war becomes accepted and in 1212, as a matter of fact, Pope Innocent III even declares a crusade in Iberia. So, at least in this time and place, the Christian powers have their own cultural approach to warfare on their side. And by the year 1469, the map of Iberia is starting to look more recognizable. Portugal owns the eastern and southeastern coasts, with more or less the same territory it owns today. If you were Portuguese and you see a map from 1469, you can see your country there. If you're Spanish, you would have to wait a little bit, though. See, the rest of Iberia is a little bit more divided. Uh, Castile rules all of central Iberia, as well as the northwestern coast and a bit of the southwestern coast near Cadiz and a bit of the southeastern coast near Cartagena. It is by far the largest power in Spain at this time. In the middle of the southern coast, between Castile and the coast, the Islamic Emirate of Granada still holds a strip of land and there is another Christian kingdom, Aragon, occupying northeastern Spain and the Balearic Islands in the Mediterranean. For what it's worth, there is also the tiny kingdom of Navarre on the French border. But Navarre is basically an Aragonese puppet at this point. As a matter of fact, the king of Aragon at this time is also the king of Navarre. Why have we jumped to the year 1469? What's important about that year? 1469 is important because it is the year of one of history's most significant weddings. And this is a wedding between Isabella, the heir to the Castilian throne, and Ferdinand, the heir to the Aragonese throne. Now, a little background here. Isabella is the younger sister of Castilian King Henry IV. And they have an agreement that she will be his heir and that they will both agree on her spouse. But Henry tries to go back on this deal. Instead, he has Isabella engaged to King Alfonso V of Spain. Portugal. And at the same time, he negotiates an agreement between his daughter, Joanna, and Alfonso's son, John II. And what Henry's trying to accomplish here is that uh, upon his and Alfonso's deaths, their children, Joanna and John II, would rule Portugal and Castile together. Now, to go back to our earlier example, let's like a corporate merger or an alliance between two crime families. Well, Isabella does not want to marry Alfonso V. She instead turns to Ferdinand, the son of yet another John II, John II, King of Aragon and Navarre. John had just inherited the throne from his brother, and Ferdinand's claim on the throne is secure. Ferdinand and Isabella had actually been engaged in the past, but John had broken it off in search of a better match for his son. 
So the two already know each other, and unusually for this time, for a royal couple, it seems as if the two are actually in love. They make plans to elope. But this marriage is not just forbidden by their families. Isabella and Ferdinand are second cousins, and they need a dispensation from the Pope to be allowed to marry. With the date of the wedding fast approaching, Ferdinand has a bishop friend of his forge a phony dispensation. Imagine Isabella's irritation when the actual dispensation arrived a few weeks later, but anyway, Isabella leaves her brother's palace on the excuse of visiting their uncle, and instead she goes to a manor outside a nearby convent. This has all been arranged, and Ferdinand has snuck all the way from Aragon dressed as a servant, and at this manner he's able to meet with Isabella, and then on October 19th, 1469, the two are married. And Ferdinand and Isabella agree from the beginning to work together to gain both the crowns of Aragon and Castile and to govern both kingdoms. And when they eventually rule, they will use the motto Tanto Monta, which means as much one as the other, which will eventually become Tanto Monta, Monta Tanto, Isabel Como Fernando. It is one and the same, Isabella the same as Ferdinand. But before they could rule as one, they would have to win both crowns. See, John II and Henry IV are both angry, but John II, the king of Portugal, Ferdinand's dad, well, he can't do much about it. Ferdinand is his son and his heir, and like it or not, Isabella is now his daughter-in-law. But... Henry IV, Isabella's brother, is absolutely furious. Right? She has gone and blown up this corporate merger he was trying to work out. And so he removes her as his heir and instead makes his seven-year-old daughter, Joanna, his official heir. Yes, this is another Joanna because it seems like these people do recycle a lot of names. Anyway, uh, she remains engaged to the other John II, the Portuguese heir, at this time. But there is some doubt as to whether Joanna is actually Henry IV's daughter. All right again, we're talking about legitimacy here. And there is reason to question whether or not Henry IV actually fathered Joanna, much less anybody. See, uh, for one thing, he supposedly never even had sex with his first wife. Uh, the couple had their marriage annulled after several years with no children on the basis that they had never consummated it. And there are rumors that Henry is either impotent or gay. Now, to be fair... Many of those rumors come from Isabella's allies, so it's hard to say what's true and what's propaganda, but there is some question as to whether Joanna is indeed the legitimate daughter of Henry IV. But at any rate, uh, Henry IV dies in 1474, right? five years after this forbidden marriage between Isabella and Ferdinand, and both Joanna and Isabella declare themselves the Queen of Castile. While the succession is in doubt, different nobles have taken different sides and are positioning for a potential civil war, in early 1475, Alfonso V of Portugal invades, and... He doesn't marry Joanna to his son. He marries Joanna himself. Thus, potentially uniting Portugal and Castile. And uh, I should mention, by the way, that Alfonso is Joanna's uncle. Ew. Uh, 
and at this, Castile falls into civil war, and early on, most of the nobility is favoring Joanna. After all, she has the support of the powerful Portuguese king. But Isabella also has an important ally, her husband Ferdinand. With the full support of his father, Ferdinand leads an Aragonese army to bolster the ranks of Isabella's forces. When this happens, Alfonso V is in the middle of an invasion of Portugal, but he doesn't want to meet Ferdinand in battle, so even though he has the opportunity to take over the Castilian capital of Madrid and potentially end the war right there, he turns back and returns his army to Portugal without getting close to the Castilian capital. And when this happens, it's a big deal for Isabella's cause because a number of Joanna's supporters defect. And again, they have been supporting her largely because she has the support of her uncle king, Alfonso, from Portugal and his army. Well, if he's not going to be doing anything with his army, if he's just going to turn around and run away, well, why not just side with Isabella and get the whole thing over with? And one of these supporters of Joanna's that defects is the city of Zamora. The people there in this city in central Spain turn against Joanna and they put the Portuguese garrison there under siege. And Ferdinand decides to take advantage of this. Right, He's going to conquer this Portuguese garrison and score a little propaganda victory over the Portuguese and encourage more nobles to switch sides from Joanna to Isabella. So he rushes to Zamora and puts the garrison under siege, or should I say joins the existing uh, citizen besiegers. And shortly thereafter, Alfonso in Portugal learns of this. Now, it's one thing to avoid a pitched battle in the field. It's another thing to abandon your garrison. If you're just going to abandon your garrisons to their fate, nobody's going to fight for you. And Alfonso knows this. If he's going to have any chance of claiming the Castilian throne, he has to do something here at Zamora, so... He leads a relief army in January of 1476, and the army arrives outside Zamora in mid-February. And they besiege Ferdinand, who is still there besieging their garrison. So you have one of those situations in history where a army is laying siege to an enemy and simultaneously being besieged, but Ferdinand manages to ride this out longer than his attackers, and a lack of supplies forces Alfonso to turn back towards the Portuguese border. And Ferdinand pursues him. He decides that Forcing Alfonso into a field battle is even more important than this siege at Zamora, so he takes off after the Portuguese king and the two armies meet outside the nearby city of Toro. The two sides will fight to a draw at the Battle of Toro. The Portuguese left flank will defeat Ferdinand's forces on the Castilian right flank, but Ferdinand's allies on the Castilian left flank will defeat Alfonso himself on the other side. So there is really no decisive result on the battlefield, and both sides withdraw to fight another day. But Ferdinand 
comes up with a brilliant plan. He sends messengers throughout Castile with news of the great victory of Isabella's army. And it turns into a huge propaganda victory and most of Joanna's remaining allies defect. The war drags on for five years. France gets involved. They try to invade Navarre and distract Ferdinand up there, but he ends up defeating some French sympathizers there and reestablishes control. Uh, the Portuguese do win a major battle at sea, uh, and they capture a Castilian fleet off the coast of West Africa. Uh, in this battle, the Battle of Guinea, uh, the Portuguese fleet basically sails into the harbor, finds the Castilians all ashore uh, trading with the locals, and they capture the fleet along with its cargo, which consists of a huge quantity of gold and also, unfortunately, slaves. But there's not really much doubt as to what the ultimate outcome is going to be. Through all of this, Alfonso never seriously poses a military threat to the ground armies of Castile, and in 1479, a peace treaty is signed. In this treaty... Alfonso V formally recognizes Isabella as the legitimate ruler of Castile, and Joanna concedes any claim. Though, ironically, Joanna will go on to become a successful queen of Portugal in her later years. As a result of her many naval victories, though, uh, Portugal did get the right to all overseas colonial territories, except for the Canary Islands. Now, Keep in mind, this is 1479, Columbus has not sailed yet. At this time, overseas colonial territories means the Azores and the West African coast. Castile is specifically allowed to keep the Canaries. In this same year, this same year, 1479, at Isabella is formally recognized, finally, as Queen of Castile, John II of Aragon dies, and Ferdinand inherits his throne. Ferdinand and Isabella now jointly rule what is modern-day Spain. But at the time, it was still two dynastic holdings, two separate kingdoms. People at the time called it the Spains. And the king and the queen are dubbed the Catholic monarchs. They receive this nickname uh, for a handful of reasons. Uh, it's partially because they revive the practice of the Inquisition. As you will recall... Spain, or the Spains, have been going through centuries of religious strife. There are many former Jews and former Muslims who are suspected of being a religious fifth column, so to speak, secretly corrupting the nation from within. Those people are put to the question, and some are burned at the stake. Another reason Isabella and Ferdinand are known as the Catholic monarchs is because of their insistence on strong moral values. Right? In their policies, both of them, but particularly Isabella, uh, reverse the corruption that the Spanish lands had long been notorious for. According to the contemporary writer, Marineo Siculo, quote, The royal knight Alvaro Yanez de Lugo was condemned to be beheaded, although he offered 40,000 ducados for the war against the Moors to the court, so that those monies could spare his life. This matter was discussed with the queen, and there were some who told her to pardon him, 
since these funds for the war were better than the death of that man, and her highness should take them. But the queen, preferring justice to cash, very prudently refused them, and although she could have confiscated all his goods, which were many, she did not take any of them to avoid any note of greed, or that it be thought that she had not wished to pardon him in order to have his goods. Instead, she gave them all to the children of the aforesaid knight. Unquote. But Ferdinand's and Isabella's main claim to fame as Catholic monarchs comes from their reconquest of Granada, the last remaining Muslim enclave in Spain. Beginning in 1482, just three years after taking full control of their joint kingdom, they begin a series of seasonal campaigns to seize one Granadan stronghold after another. During these campaigns, Castile provides the bulk of the troops and will have the right to rule the land, but Aragon contributes artillery and naval forces. And, as a matter of fact, they actually get outside help as well. See, the Pope suspends the annual tithe. This is the money that the monarchs are supposed to give to the Pope every year. Yes, at this time, all Catholic monarchs are expected to give money to the Pope every year to support the Church, but the Pope waives this requirement during this period uh, in recognition that they are spending the money to do God's work in Granada. The last people who help out the Catholic monarchs with the conquest are many of the Muslims themselves. Uh, the small emirate at this time is divided by a civil war, and it is so divided that by 1485 it is literally geographically divided. Uh, Granada is split in two by Spanish forces. Now, Emir Muhammad XII, also known as Bobdil, would eventually unite the various factions, but it would be too little too late. And in June of 1491, the combined Spanish army has besieged the last Granadan army in their capital city of <clears throat> Granada. And... The Moors, as they are called, Moors simply being a word derived from Moroccan, by the way, uh, the Moors are entirely surrounded, although they do have artillery on the city walls. In his book, A Hundred Decisive Battles, historian Paul K. Davis tells the story colorfully. He says, quote, After a time of relatively passive siege, the two forces met in July 1491 in the wake of an exchange of insults. In the midst of a sally against the Spanish, a Moorish soldier had flung his spear towards the king's pavilion. That night, a number of Spanish troops snuck into the city and attached a copy of the Ave Maria, a prayer, to the door of a mosque. The following day, the same Moor who had thrown the spear, named Yarfa, rode his horse in front of the Spanish lines with the Ave Maria tied to its tail. This last incident took place during a visit to the front by Queen Isabella, who was escorted to a point near the city by a large force of cavalry and heavy infantry under the command of the Marquis of Cadiz, Don Rodrigo Ponce de Leon. The Moors had opened the gates and deployed troops in response, but Isabella forbade her troops to engage, as she merely wanted to view the city and not be the cause of anyone's death. When, however, Yarfa desecrated the Ave Maria, Ferdinand acceded to the wish of one of his soldiers to engage in single combat. The two armored knights fought on horseback and then on foot until, after an even struggle, the Spanish knight prevailed. During the combat, both armies had observed the rules of chivalry and refrained from interfering. But 
Once their champion was dead, the Moors attacked. Unable to maintain his queen's wish against fighting in the face of this onslaught, the Marquis committed his troops. Artillery fired from the fortress at the Spanish, but their heavy cavalry broke the assault, and the Moors began to retreat behind the city walls, leaving behind 2,000 casualties. In the wake of this victory, the Spanish suffered a disaster. That night, a candle in Queen Isabella's tent caught some curtains on fire, and the result was a conflagration that burned down most of the Spanish camp. The following morning, to prove to the Moors that he was not really broken, Ferdinand paraded his troops before the city walls. Boabdil responded by sending his troops out of the gates into battle. A large number of skirmishes ensued until finally the Spanish gained the upper hand and the Moors once again retreated into the city. For the next three months, the Moors looked down on the Christian camp as it was rebuilt into a small permanent town that came to be called Santa Fe. They watched and starved. Unquote. In November, the emir agrees to surrender. Ferdinand and Isabella agree that there will be no sacking of the city, no retribution against local magistrates, and that there is to be freedom of religion for Muslims and Christians alike. Furthermore, under the terms of the Treaty of Granada, Muslims who wish to leave will have their travel paid for by the Castilian crown, to whichever Muslim country they desire. On January 1st, 1492, Ferdinand officially receives the key to the city, and the last Muslim enclave in Iberia falls into Christian hands. But the Catholic monarch's agreement to respect Muslim religious rights does not extend to their Jewish population. Just a few months later, on March 31, 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella issue the Alhambra Decree. All Spanish Jews have until July 31st to convert to Catholicism or to leave the country. Out of approximately 100,000 Jews remaining in Spain at this time, about 50,000 convert and a similar number leave the country. And these strict rules against Judaism, especially against so-called crypto-Judaism, people who were Jewish and converted to Catholicism supposedly just to fit in while maintaining their Jewish practices and secrets, well, these concerns by the Spanish government would last for a very long time. The last trial for crypto-Judaism in Spain would be held in 1818. Now, I should point out that this expulsion of the Jews is not unique in Europe. England and Wales, for example, had expelled Jews two years earlier in 1490. Hungary had expelled their Jews in 1360, and France had done it four times, most recently in 1394. Lithuania had expelled theirs in 1445, and after 1492, Lithuania would do the same again in 1495, and Portugal would expel their Jewish population in 1497, and this is just a small sample of the many times during this period when Jewish people were forced to either convert or get up and leave their country. Many of them actually relocated to the Middle East, to the Ottoman Empire, which at the time, by comparison, was relatively religiously tolerant. Anyway, after a Muslim uprising in 1499, the Catholic monarchs break the Treaty of Granada. 
Muslims, too, are ordered to either become Christians or to leave in the year 1502. Now, if I were living in the year 1492, and you asked me which of these events mattered most, what's the most important thing that happened this year, Dan? Is it the fall of Granada or the expulsion of the Jews? And I would say, well, it's the fall of Granada by far. That is the most important thing that has happened in the Spains for a long time. But I would have been wrong. Being a person of the time, I would have lacked hindsight, and I would have overlooked something that most people would have missed at the time. See, a Genoan mariner named Cristoforo Colombo had gotten funding to take three ships to look for a westward course to the Americas. Yes, this is the same guy we Americans call Christopher Columbus and the Spanish call Cristobal Colon, and yes, he would be sailing with Isabella's blessing and in the name of the Castilian crown. Now, at the time, in 1492, Columbus's mission is widely ridiculed. Now, I should clarify, people know the world is round at this time. They've known the world is round for a very, very long time, for millennia. For as long as there has been writing, people have known the world is round. And since the days of the ancient Greeks people have even had a pretty good idea of how big the world is. So the reason Columbus is ridiculed is not because of the you know, silly old idea that people thought he'd sail off the edge of the world. It's because, well, take a look at a map or a globe and imagine sailing from Spain to China if there were no land masses in between. That is quite a long distance. That is a lot longer than any sailing ship of the age could possibly be equipped to sail without stopping for supplies. And the people who were mocking Columbus were right. There is no way you could have covered that distance, and if... Columbus does not simply stumble into the West Indies, into the islands of the Caribbean, well, there's a good chance his expedition simply disappears and no one in the Spains ever hears from them again. And the interesting thing is that while Columbus will quote-unquote discover several Caribbean islands, he will constantly insist that he has still reached Asia despite the obviously short distance and despite the fact that, if again, if you look at the Caribbean and the Spice Islands, they're not even at the same latitude. Uh, this guy failed geography badly, even if he had, as he did, if he only you know had access to geographic knowledge of the time, he still failed badly. But the issue of legitimacy nonetheless arises again in the case of these islands. See, in the absence of a Christian monarch laying any claim to them, the Spaniards see these islands as free game. Never mind the local chiefs. We can claim these in the name of the Spanish crown. And... This is huge. Imagine an alternate history where the Emirate of Granada is triumphant and launches their own re-reconquista and re -re retakes Iberia, and then a few decades later, Muslim mariners discover the New World. Well, isn't that a game-changer? Now, early Spanish settlements rely almost entirely on plantation labor. And 
Isabella bans the taking of Native Americans as slaves, but Columbus treats them as second-class citizens anyway, uh, and after one massacre, he is recalled to Spain, and he is relieved as the governor of Spain's overseas territories. But this ban on slavery also gets perverted, and since... Spanish landlords need slaves, they simply import them from Africa instead. Did I say Spanish landlords? I meant Castilians. See, the so-called Spanish colonies in the Americas actually belonged to the Castilian crown. When they would colonize the mainland and ships would sail along the Caribbean coast, on the Spanish Main, they should have called it the Castilian Main. Although Ferdinand and Isabella's motto does get a little extension around this time. Plus ultra, meaning and all the rest. Now, Major Spanish conquests would not come until after the death of Ferdinand and Isabella. There would be no mainland colonies, no conquest of the Aztecs. But even the early Spanish discoveries in the Caribbean are enough to force the Portuguese to renegotiate their treaty regarding overseas territories. And in 1494, the Treaty of Tordesillas is signed which defines zones of influence in the New World. And this comes with the blessing of the Pope, again lending it some legitimacy in the eyes of those who are asked to adhere to it. And this division of influence in the New World is why Brazil speaks Portuguese and has Portuguese culture, while the rest of South and Central America largely speaks Spanish and has a Spanish-descended culture. Now, it's early during this age of colonization, in November of 1504, that Isabella of Castile dies of natural causes. She's succeeded by her and Ferdinand's third child, their oldest living child, who is named Joanna. It's another Joanna in this story. And this Joanna is married to a man named Philip von Habsburg, the young son of the Holy Roman Emperor. And young Philip, who is already heir to the throne of Austria and thus to the imperial throne, uh, he now also becomes the king of Castile. But Ferdinand is still alive, and he is the king of Aragon, and Castile and Aragon are now divided again. So Ferdinand has Joanna declared insane, and he tries to take control. He has coins issued in his and Joanna's name, Philip von Habsburg does the same, so you have coins from Castile from this same time period uh, that say Ferdinand and Joanna, and some and others say Philip and Joanna. Uh, and there is a protracted political struggle, but Philip dies unexpectedly in 1506, and Joanna then rules Castile in name, but Ferdinand is the real power in all Spain. And that ends with Ferdinand's death in 1516, ten years later. And by then, one of Joanna and Philip's children is old enough to be co-ruler. Yes, Philip did get her pregnant before he died. And as the grandson of both Ferdinand and Isabella, this child is eligible to rule both kingdoms. 
this grandson, Charles I of Spain, would take control in 1517 at the age of 17. Now, Joanna would remain officially the queen of both kingdoms until her death in 1555, but she remains confined to her chambers during most of this period. She is known as Joanna the Mad. Now, historians are not sure as to what exact madness she suffered from. I have read a few people who speculate that it may have been depression that she was struggling with. We really can't say. It's tough to say if she really was struggling with anything at all or if all of this wasn't just something Ferdinand did to keep power and then something that Charles kept up to keep power. It is certainly possible, but regardless, Charles I is king of both Castile and Aragon in all but name, and as a matter of fact, if you look at his Wikipedia page, it even says King of Spain, 1516 to 1556, during most of which time Joanna was still alive and still the queen, but we will give the historians and the Wikipedia editors their due here because Charles I might as well be the king, and he forms what is known in history as a personal union. That is a union of two different kingdoms under one individual who holds title to both crowns. And so Aragon and Castile maintain their own separate parliaments, their own separate bureaucracies, their own separate postal services. All the nuts and bolts of government are separate in both areas, but both of them have the same king, Charles I. This won't be the only time this would happen in history. There were, as a matter of fact, many personal unions throughout history. Just to name a few, uh, you have England and Scotland for a while before they became Great Britain. You have Denmark, Norway more than once. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, as a matter of fact, even Spain and Portugal would be ruled for a brief period by the same leader. Such an arrangement, however temporary it might be, could be a potent geopolitical force under the command of one ruler. One mafia family has suddenly, instead of running one or two neighborhoods, monopolized an entire city, so to speak, to use our mafia analogy. And Charles I, as the head of the Habsburg dynasty, which he would become, well, he is a prime example of that. Before his death, he will become Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, as well as the King of Aragon and Castile. He will rule much of modern-day France, in his capacity as the Duke of Burgundy. He will oversee, at least from afar, the Spanish conquest of Mexico. This is one of the most powerful men in history. He is also perhaps the pinnacle of what dynastic politics would ever be able to produce. See, we are at the time in history, here in the 1500s, at the dawn of the Enlightenment, where the age of dynastic politics is coming to an end and where the age of nationalist politics is coming to the fore. During his time as Holy Roman Emperor, Charles will witness the beginnings of the Protestant Reformation. Now, that's a story for another podcast. I said there have been entire podcast series on the Reconquista. 
Same thing for the Protestant Reformation. This is a huge subject. We're not going to cover it in five minutes. Suffice it to say that there is some controversy over the legitimacy of the Catholic Church and the Pope in particular as the leader of all Christians, and that a number of German lords and leaders are starting to follow the doctrines of a certain Martin Luther, the Lutheran faith. Again, that's a story for another podcast, but this is leading to trouble for Charles, who is supposed to be the overseer of this empire. Now, the Holy Roman Empire is not directly a possession of Charles. He runs Austria, and then he's basically an arbiter of sorts for the rest of the empire. It's really bizarre. The The title emperor here is really a misnomer. But as the spiritual leader of the empire, if nothing else, Charles V leads a series of crackdowns on the Protestants and is unsuccessful. And this is the case for a number of reasons, uh, largely because the Ottomans are continuing to put pressure on Austria from the Balkans. Uh, Charles V is never able to direct his militaries against the Protestants, at least not as much as he would like. And even if he is, boy, wouldn't it be better if these Protestants, who are fellow Christians after all, could help him out defending against the Ottomans. So he ends up being forced to tolerate the Reformation. So unlike earlier times in the history of the Catholic Church where uh, quote-unquote heretical beliefs were stomped out relentlessly, in this case, uh, Charles is forced to tolerate his own Protestant uh, subsidiaries. And in 1555, after years of internal religious conflict, uh, Charles V announces the Peace of Augsburg. And much like the emperor who puts it forth, this Peace of Augsburg is perhaps the zenith of dynastic politics. It is based on the principle of quius regio, ius religio which means whose realm their religion. In other words, each local lord or count or even bishop could determine the official religion of their region, as long as it was Catholic or Lutheran. All right, we still weren't going to have any of those Jews running anything. Those Calvinists and Anabaptists, well, we don't really trust them either, but all right, if you're Catholic or Lutheran, you can choose your own religion as the leader. This would be a temporary solution to the infighting in the Holy Roman Empire because it makes every leader happy, right? Your realm, your religion, we're all good, right? Right? Yes, temporarily we are all good, but this will serve as the basis for future conflict. See, it begins to frustrate many of the people in this area. These are very religious times. Right? A secular individual might not particularly care about this. Most modern people wouldn't think twice about switching from one church to another, even if they attend church, which most of us don't these days. But back then, folks took their religion quite seriously, and 
Well, if you were a Catholic and you were forced to convert to Lutheranism or vice versa, that would be cause to move perhaps to a neighboring duchy or what have you where your religion is respected. Well, let's say you move to a duchy with the religion of your choice and the duke dies a few years later and his son takes over and that young whippersnapper follows the wrong flavor of Christianity. Well, all of a sudden you're in the same situation, right? You've either got to move or convert and it begins to wear on the people and... There are other issues, and we will get into this in another episode very shortly, but suffice it to say that within a couple generations, Europe will be engulfed in the Thirty Years' War, a war which some historians have called World War Zero. This war will change Europe and the world forever, and During this time, we will see the birth of nationalism in its modern form. That's right, more than 30 episodes in, we are starting to approach the point where we get into the nitty-gritty of this season's main topic. As for Spain, would technically be Castile and Aragon, the Spains, until 1714, but after Charles I, it would always be united. No one wanted to rule just Castile or just Aragon. They wanted all of it. And until the early 1700s, Habsburg kings and queens would rule all of Spain as a single nation in practice, if not always in theory. During Charles I's reign, as we touched on, Spanish exploration of the New World would kick into high gear. Hernán Cortés would invade Mexico and unite a coalition of local tribes to overthrow their Aztec overlords. Little did these tribes know that they would only be installing new Spanish overlords there would be further conquests covering much of the New World. Charles's reign would be a time of unprecedented growth and prosperity. It forges a new Spanish identity, a shared experience for the people of Castile and Aragon. This personal union in the form of Charles I, created not just a major European nation, but much of the New World. History would have been vastly different if Castile and Aragon had gone to war in the mid-1500s over colonial possessions. Instead, all of those regions have a shared Hispanic heritage. And that's why it's relevant. Greetings once again, it's Dan, and I'm here to let you know about a few things we're doing to expand the relevant history universe. For one thing, if you had not heard about it yet, we do have a Patreon channel. You can find the link to that in the description, and what this channel offers is exclusive access, yes, exclusive for members only, to a new series called Dan's War College. This is a monthly video series with videos uh, about a half hour long where I myself, Dan Toller, explore and break down military battles or units or tactics from history and explain why they worked or didn't work, as the case may be. You get all of this, as well as a shout-out on the main Relevant History show for $5 a month. 
Alternatively, if you would like to support the show uh, with a smaller contribution, you can also find a link in the episode description to the Salad Tossers Patreon network. Now, as you might imagine, this is a network of more irreverent creators, and on their channel, I show a little bit more irreverent side. That series is called Irrelevant History, and there we discuss interesting historical novelties, such as the bear that served in the Polish army in World War II. Once again, you can find the link to that in the episode description as well, and that comes at the low, low price of $1 per month. But you don't have to spend money to support the show. As a matter of fact, one of the most helpful things you could do is leave a review or a nice positive rating on one of the many podcast distribution services. If you listen on iTunes or Google Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you happen to listen, if you leave a review or a rating, it really does help other people find the show. And while you're at it, make sure to share and tell your friends. If you like it, chances are you know a few other people who will as well. Last but not least, if you want to get a hold of me, whether because I made a mistake or whatever other reason you'd like to get in touch, you can find Relevant History on Twitter at Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan T-O-L-E-R Podcast. Or you can find the show on Facebook at Dan Toller. That's Dan dot Toller. And it will be the Dan Toller with the Relevant History logo, not one of the individual people profiles out there. Uh, finally, you can send me an email at Dan Toller Podcast at gmail.com. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast at gmail.com. For all other show-related things, including links to my blog posts, which have not been updated in quite some time, well, you can find all of that at dantollerpodcast.com. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening.